hi everyone. Welcome to today's tutorial. I'm Annie and I'll be coordinating today. We're delighted to have Professor Antonella Saracci today giving the presentation. But first of all, I'm just going to pass over to Antonis, who is going to say a few words first of all. Thank you, Annie. Well, Antonella Sorazze, the famous Italian linguist working in Edinburgh, UK. Well, what can I say about the person or the subject? For the person, it's meaningless. Antonella is a leading expert in the field. Uh, if you just go to Google and write your name, it will be countless of publications. Well, about the subject. Uh, we had a similar subject the other day, last one. It has always been around, but the last years, I think it has come back strongly. Uh, a lot of people are doing with the, are dealing with education, bilingualism, and all this. But now, in a more scientific way, in the old days, it was most educational. And we are promoting are promoting this area because we invite people. Okay. Antonella, it's a great pleasure of having you here. I pass the word to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be uh, with you. Uh, I would uh, prefer to be with you in person, but we can't do that. So <laughs> this is a, a nice replacement you know, for, uh, for being, being together in the same space, which we can't do right now. So a few words about myself. I um, am a, I'm a linguist, I'm a, an experimental linguist. Um, I work uh, at the University of Edinburgh um, and my, uh, my main area of research is uh, bilingualism over the lifespan. And uh, we'll see that by bilingualism, I really mean more than one language uh, in children, young children, older children, young adults, older adults, what it means to have more than one language from a linguistic and from a cognitive point of view. I'm a great fan of interdisciplinary research because I think that any complex subject like bilingualism um, really needs uh, researchers to work together across disciplinary boundaries because there is so much that needs to be understood from different perspectives, pulling together different kinds of expertise. Um, I also work on other areas, you know, that I won't uh, say much uh, about today. For example, the interface between syntax and uh, pragmatics. Um, and I've written about this, but this is not the topic of today's um, lecture. And I, um, I'm also very active on the public engagement front. I direct, uh, I was a founder, founding director of the Center of Bilingualism Matters, which tries to bring research to people. And uh, people uh, need to know more about bilingualism and language learning because they have to make decisions about, about bilingualism and language learning all the time, about their children, about their students, about their patients, about their policies, about their companies. And very often they don't know enough and there are many misconceptions. So what we do, not only in Edinburgh, but in uh, all over the world, we have an international network of 29 branches at the moment, including one in Greece, um, we try to uh, bridge the gap between research and society and make sure that people uh, make decisions that are informed rather than based on prejudices and misconceptions. So I, I will now try to uh, share my slides. 
Um, no, this is not. Yes, here it is. Can you see the slide? Um, I can't okay. see the PowerPoint, no. You can't, okay. Um, can you see it now? Uh, yeah, I, I see, it. Antonella, I see it. Uh, it says sharing is paused. Uh, let me let me just try again. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. the right one. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, my title, monolingualism a species faces extinction, is a deliberate provocation, <laughs> as you can probably guess. Um, but I think it's a it's a very serious issue that uh, um, that we we really have to face now, and it's been with us for uh, for quite a long time because um, in uh, in linguistics as well as in research on bilingualism, what we normally do is a comparison between. Uh, monolingual native speakers and bilingual speakers. So our point of reference in research on bilingualism is very often the monolingual speaker. That is the point of reference against which we measure bilingual, uh, uh, bilingual competence, bilingual behavior, the bilingual brain, etc. Um, and connected to that is really the comparison between uh, native speakers and non-native speakers. Uh, so people who were born and raised with one language, as opposed to people like myself, for example, with English, who learned English later in life. So a non-native speaker. And when we compare these two groups, then the difference between the, the groups is evidence that we use to, um, to argue for our claims. Um, this is a wider issue, actually, in the whole of linguistics. Linguistic research, as we know, um, has been uh, predominantly conducted in monolingual countries, typically the mo uh, countries in the Anglosphere, which is uh, the, the country where if you look for them, you know, you, you, you still find lots of monolinguals, although even in that case, we'll see later, uh, we can begin to raise doubts about the pure monolingualism of, uh, of, uh, of people. Um, but basically, the concept of the native speaker, the native monolingual norm, uh, is also based on, uh, on the fact that much of research has been done in these, in these countries. And so, you know, the ideal, uh, the ideal native speaker, which underlies much research in linguistics over the last uh, 60 years, um, is also based on that. Um, and acceptability judgments, which are still, you know, the main kind of data in linguistic theory research. Uh, and I've, I've contributed to uh, methods for uh, eliciting acceptability judgments. But basically, acceptability judgments are a, a, a measure uh, a, that involves consciously reported perceptions of acceptability made by educated native monolinguals, typically. Um, so again, that is a place where you we find the native monolingual as a point of reference for research. Um, and uh, and the, the native monolingual norm, as I said, in research on second language acquisition or second language learning, but also in, uh, in uh, a evaluations of na non-native speakers, um, it's always there. I mean, you know, in the background, the idea that uh, you do or don't speak like a native speaker. Uh, you'd sound or you don't sound like a native speaker. And when we come, uh, come up with uh, uh, gradients of competence, and that is taken from my own research, so I'm as guilty as anybody else. I'm not uh, just talking about other people, I'm talking about my own practice. 
this term near native speaker, which uh, is often used to denote the highest level that you can reach in a second language that you start uh, as an adult. Well, that if you think about it, that term inherently says uh, or suggests that you are very good. You are almost like a native speaker, but not quite. So you're nearly there, but not quite. Again, the term of comparison is the native monolingual uh, speaker. And when, he, when, when we come to research, cognitive research on uh, bilingualism, and I'll mention this uh, later, um, what, we, uh, what we do when we talk about a bilingual advantage or a bilingual disadvantage, again, you know, against what? An advantage against what monolinguals would do or a disadvantage with respect to what monolinguals would do um, uh, or would think or would behave. Uh, so again, you know, the native monolingual norm underlies much cognitive research on bilingualism as well. And that means that implicitly at least, and I'm, I'm getting to the core of the problem here, um, we regard the bilingual as the sum of two native monolinguals. So, so the kind of perfect bilingual that we have in mind is a bilingual that behaves like a monolingual speaker in language A and a monolingual speaker in language B. And this is a, a really what we, we need to uh, uh, argue against that a bilingual, and we'll talk about this more uh, later, a bilingual is not the sum of two monolingual native speakers. Uh, is something really quite different. But in many, and uh, I'm, I'm not going into uh, public engagement research, but in much practice in the real world, we often use the measures that were developed on the basis of monolingual norms, and we use them to measure bilinguals. And of course, you know, if you measure, for example, bilingual children with instruments and tests that are developed for monolingual norms, based on monolingual norms, very often bilingual children don't come out very well. Um, not because, you know, so for example, not because uh, they don't know, they know fewer words than a monolingual, but because their vocabulary is spread across two languages, for example. So uh, let's get into, into research and uh, just uh, show you what, what I mean. And I'll be, res I'll be referring to some of my own research, but also other people's research, not in great detail. We can come back to this if you want later. So um, what I'm, I'm going to show is that instead of talking about bilingual, being bilingual versus being monolingual, we should really be talking about degrees of bilingualism. So how bilingual are you? Let's start from these cognitive you know, and linguistic effects of bilingualism. Remember that the effects of bilingualism are often seen as advantages or disadvantages typically with comparison with a monolingual norm. So I don't want to go into the details here, just the summary. Uh, bilinguals have been found to have higher metalinguistic awareness compared to monolinguals, particularly in, uh, in children. Um, young children, young bilingual children have an inroad into some aspects of early literacy and there is plenty of research on that as kind of facilitation that bilingual children have with respect to aspects of early literacy. Uh, enhanced language learning skills, so learning a third language when you already have two, or learning a fourth language when you have more than one is easier than learning a second language when you only have one. From a cognitive point of view, beyond language, these are effects that have been uh, talked about quite a lot, uh, both in the literature, but also in the real world. So for example, a better awareness of other people's perspectives. So the fact that uh, a bilingual child becomes aware that it is possible to have a different point of view or a different perspective from their own. Uh, and this comes from the realization that not everybody is bilingual and you have to choose the right language depending on who you're talking to. And that means appreciating a different linguistic perspective. And that is extended more generally to appreciating different perspectives in general. Um, 
Uh, the effects have been found on focused attention, uh, so the ability to focus attention on uh, uh, details that matter for the task that one is doing, uh, at the same time ignoring uh, aspects that don't matter, so less, uh, sus uh, less um, um, uh, 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 better ability not to be distracted, and better ability to handle conflicting information in general. And that is also related to task switching, better ability to switch from one task that requires attention to certain features to another task that requires attention to different features and adaptability to change. So adaptability to changing circumstances. So all of these have been widely discussed in, in the literature. Now, why these effects? The, uh, the, the, the most uh, mentioned, the, the most frequently mentioned uh, reason is that um, languages, uh, all languages in uh, multilingual minds are always active. So you can't turn off a language in the morning because you don't need it today and put it in the drawer. Um, you constantly have to choose one language and inhibit or exclude the others. Uh, clearly, we'll see not to the same degree in all contexts, uh, but that means that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, that's me, by the way. I'm speaking English to you, but my Italian, my native language, as well as the other languages I know, are very much active in my brain, and I'm trying to uh, take them, you know, out of the picture so that they interfere. They don't interfere uh, very much. Um, sorry, and that means that comes that underlies uh, the bilingual ability to handle uh, conflicting information and monitor conflicting information. Obviously, this doesn't apply to all bilinguals. For example, bimodal bilinguals, uh, people who um, use a spoken language and a signed language don't need to inhibit uh, uh, one of the languages to the same extent because the two modalities don't uh, conflict. So it is possible to sign and speak at the same time. So, but uh, let's not get into that. Most uh, unimodal bilinguals uh, had to do that. Now, the uh, the real interesting uh, discussion in the in in research and outside research at the moment has to do with the so-called replicability crisis. So, which affects um, uh, this kind of research in bilingualism. So, the fact that these effects are not always found. They are not found uh, in all cases. They are not. Um, they, they haven't been replicated, you know, um, in uh, in in all cases. So the effects are not always found. And so uh, uh, some people would say, well, uh, maybe these effects don't exist. Maybe we can't talk about you know, bilingual advantages, because unless we are able to replicate them all the time, we can't do that. Now, I think that is the wrong approach to take. Um, and I'm going to illustrate a little bit why this is wrong uh, with research on minority languages, which is a very interesting area. So minority languages, I mean indigenous minority languages, languages that are only spoken in certain places. I'm not talking about minorita minoritized languages, so languages that are uh, minority languages, even if they are spoken by many, many people in their countries, in the countries where they come from, but compared to uh, so my, migrant languages that are minoritized in particular situations. So uh, just a brief uh, um, uh, a, a survey of a bunch of minority languages where research has been found on these cognitive advantages shows that uh, the effects are not always found. So for example, for Sardinian Italian, the effects have been found. This is also research by my group. Um, by the way, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in Sardinian because uh, my mother uh, comes from there. So, uh, and I never learned Sardinian because my mother never spoke it to me because it's not a useful language, but I understand it. Um, uh, Gallic English, um, very, uh, I live in Scotland. Gaelic is the uh, most uh, uh, supported minority language. It's not the only one, but it's the one that the Scottish government invests a lot of money in. 
the effects have been found. Frisian Dutch, um, the effects have been found yes and no. They haven't been found completely, but let's say that uh, on the whole, they have been found. Welsh English, interestingly, no, they haven't been found. Um, Cypriot Greek and Greek, they have been found. Catalan Spanish, they have been found, but Basque Spanish, they haven't been found. So we have a, you know, a picture that it doesn't give a, a coherent, uh, you know, um, a coherent conclusion about minority languages. Why not? Well, because these minority languages um, are quite different in a number of respects. For example, with respect to patterns of bilingual use. So we have so-called dual language contexts. Uh, so these are contexts where um, uh, both languages are uh, understood and spoken in a variety of contexts by the majority of the population. And that applies to Welsh and English. It applies to Basque and Spanish, not to all uh, areas of uh, the Basque countries, but certainly many. Uh, it applies to Catalan Spanish. Um, as opposed to single language context where the languages are really diglossic, they are di divided by context. Language A is only spoken in, in one context, language B is only spoken in a different context. So Sardinian Italian, that is the, uh, the case. Sardinian tends to be sp spoken at home, Italian outside the home, Cypriot Greek and Greek, Gallic and English, Frisian and Dutch, all of these are uh, so-called single language context where people really, uh, when they speak one language, they don't speak the other. They really have to uh, exclude the other uh, because of this diglossic uh, situation. So uh, that needs to be taken into account uh, when we measure cognitive effects uh, uh, and so on. And in fact, um, uh, as Abu Talebi and Green uh, have pointed out, uh, in dual language context, this in Catalonia, for example, there is less inhibition and more switching. Less inhibition because everybody understands both languages. So you don't need to apply a lot of inhibition to one of the languages. Um, and there is a lot more switching from one language to the other. As opposed to single language contexts like Sardinia, for example, where, as I said before, if you speak one language, you really have to inhibit the other because they're not both spoken in the same context and there is a lot less switching. The other factor that is interesting from a language, from a linguistic point of view is the degree of typological distance. And this is something that cognitive research on bilingualism really hasn't looked at with the attention that it deserves. So we have more similar languages like Catalan and Spanish, Sardinia and Italian, Cypriot Greek and Greek, Frisian and Dutch, where the effects are, the cognitive effects are typically found, as opposed to more dissimilar languages. I mean, uh, with the, 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 the exception of Basque, we're all speaking about Indo-European languages, so we're not speaking about widely different linguistic families, but still, within the family, Welsh and English are more different. Basque and Spanish certainly are. Gallic English are more different. And here, you know, uh, the effects uh, tend to sometimes are found and sometimes are not found. So again, this is a, 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 relevant, a relevant factor. So for an adaptive control, cognitive control system, for typologically similar languages, uh, you have to apply more inhibition to keep them apart, precisely because they are so similar, um, uh, but there is less need for inhibition in social interaction. Uh, for typologically different languages, you have to apply perhaps less inhibition to keep them apart because they're so distant anyway, uh, uh, but more, uh, the more, there is more of a need to apply inhibition in social interaction. Um, and again, these are some references of work that we've been done, we've done on Sardinia. And, and in fact, the uh, current focus of cognitive research that we are applying as well measures not so much inhibition per se, so how well you can inhibit the language you're not using, but also how you can recover or disengage from inhibition. 
Uh, so if I switch from one language to the other, not only do I have to inhibit one language, you know, that I'm not using in a particular moment, but when I switch to the other, I have to recover from inhibition of the language that I've just inhibited. Um, and a good illustration is the so-called Stroop task. Uh, that many of you, I'm sure, know. The classic Stroop task is in list A. So, you know, you, you have to uh, name the color of the ink in which the words are written. And so you have to say uh, blue, but the word says red. And so there is a clash between the color that you have to name and the color that you can't help reading because you are prof a proficient reading reader. And, uh, you know, you have to say purple, but the word says yellow and so on. In list B, however, the problem is slightly different. Uh, let's, let's look at the first two. You have to say green and the word says blue. So there is a clash. But then look at the next one. That's, you have to say blue. The word says red, but blue is the color that you've just inhibited. So it takes you longer to recover from that inhibition. The more you've inhibited, the deeper the inhibition, the more it, it takes to recover, to disengage from inhibition. Then you have to say, uh, you have to say red, but the word says uh, yellow. Um, uh, so, and, uh, uh, sorry, the, you have to say yellow and the, and the color, you have to say red and, uh, and red is the word that you've just inhibited before and so on. So uh, this is, uh, you know, what is going on in cognitive research at the moment. But my point is that we can't expect all bilinguals to behave in the same way because there are many factors that need to be disentangled and fully understood. And I mentioned just two, uh, the, the patterns of language use and the degree of language distance. So we are not talking about binary categorical variables. So you're either bilingual or you're not bilingual. You're talking about a continuum that goes from less bilingual to more bilingual. Um, and we are talking about many modulating factors. So language distance, I've already mentioned, exposure to variation. Um, you know, for a child who grows up with two languages, uh, they typically are exposed to a lot of variation in the majority language, but not so much in the minority language. And when we advise parents what to do in bilingual upbringing for their children, we advise them to form a mini community for the minority language, unless there is one already, so that the child hears the language spoken in different ways, naturally in different ways, because no two people speak in exactly the same way. And that is good from the point of view of language acquisition, uh, because it gives the child an idea of what is possible and what is not possible in the language, but also it gives an idea that the language is actually used, you know, and can be used for the same purposes of the majority language. Um, degrees of literacy are also very important and are typically ignored in research on bilingualism. Degrees of code switching, uh, as, uh, as I said before, and attitudes are also very important. Um, I just want to mention a study that we recently did and we, we published um, a couple of months ago on language, place, and identity, where we actually um, asked children to tell us about their bilingualism. So we studied children, both heritage children, so uh, heritage speakers of, um, of community languages, but also children who, who spoke uh, indigenous minority languages like Gaelic in Scotland. Um, and we wanted to see what, what they thought about their being bilingual and about their being bilingual in those particular languages. And this is something very interesting because we don't usually talk to children, partly because, okay, if a child is uh, five months old, there's not much you can uh, get from the child or even a two-year-old, but older children, yes. Um, but even for older children, what we normally do, we ask the parents, we ask the teachers. Uh, in this project, we actually 
had a conversation with the children and we found very interesting factors, very interesting discoveries. But what we found, perhaps not surprisingly, is that positive attitudes really matter. So uh, we found, for example, that children with positive attitudes in encouraging positive uh, school and family environments are more likely to show the cognitive advantages of bilingualism, which we also measured. Uh, they also have a better knowledge of English as a majority language. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, we show this in uh, in uh, in some of the uh, the papers. So positive attitudes are very important and they shouldn't be underestimated. We can't just measure things in isolation from context. Now, uh, another point that I want to focus on is the fact that um, when you learn another language, your first language changes. This goes under the bad term of attrition. I don't like the term. I've been using it myself because it's an, an accepted term in the field. But attrition really denotes negative, negativity. It denotes erosion. It denotes loss. Um, now, uh, attrition, what I want to say is that attrition is a very natural phenomenon. So, uh, and it's becoming more and more natural because even, you know, foreign language learning is increasing in the EU, even in the country where I live. So in the United Kingdom, believe it or not, uh, which is fundamentally, you know, a, a language that, you know, where English is obviously the international language. And so motivation for language learning is not very high, but even in this country, uh, there are more and more um, uh, foreign language learning and learners. Also, there is a lot of migration from other countries. Um, so, um, so we want to know when the first language starts changing. And uh, um, so when, when does your language start changing when you learn another language? We know quite a lot about uh, changes in the mental lexicon, so in the use and access to vocabulary. And we know that the mental lexicon is really affected very early on. Um, uh, so studies have been done, for example, about uh, um, uh, visiting students abroad uh, who spent a period you know, uh, in, uh, in the country where the foreign language was spoken. After two months, they measured you know, their access to vocabulary in the first language, and it was already slower. So we're not talking about very high levels of competence in the second language, but we are talking about exposure and development of the mental lexicon in the second language that already slows down um, uh, access to native uh, vocabulary, native words. What about grammar, though, which is, you know, from my point of view, is even more interesting. And um, uh, so when we talk about individual attrition, because before I, I show you some results about grammar, um, what happens for individual attrition in speakers who move to another country, for example, take myself, for example, I left Italy many years ago, and I moved to an English speaking country. So clearly exposure to the, the native community is uh, uh, much reduced because the native community is not there anymore. Although there may be a mini community in the second language uh, country, uh, but that means much reduced exposure to language variation. Remember I mentioned this for children, how important it is to be exposed to language variation in child language development, but it's also important for language maintenance for adult speakers. So much reduced exposure to language variation and possibly interactions with other attrited speakers. So when I speak to other Italians here in Scotland, we all uh, we both undergo or ha are undergoing attrition processes to different extents. So what happens in conversation, uh, there is alignment and priming. These are very well known phenomena in uh, studied in psycholinguistics. We also study them. So we tend to align with each other. We tend to accommodate our choices to each other, which means that we 
potentially reinforce the changes that are under, we are undergoing in our native language when we use our native language in the second language environment. And we may also talk to second language speakers of our native language, uh, and uh, that is also important, as I'll show you in a second. So we have horizontal transmission of attrition changes in communities because of alignment, because of this uh, accommodation to each other's linguistic choices. Um, uh, the larger the community of uh, uh, migrants, if you want, I'm a migrant uh, also, uh, the larger the community, uh, the more these, uh, you get this horizontal transmission of uh, changes due to attrition, and so potentially reinforcement of these changes. And then, you know, when these, these uh, uh, first generation speakers speak to their children, then what happens is that the grammar may start changing. So what happens is children get input from attracted parents. And this is a link that is should really be studied more uh, in research on bilingual in child uh, research on child bilingualism. Uh, the fact that many bilingual children, if not most, uh, get input from at least one parent who's undergoing attrition in their native language. So, for example, the Italian that my children, my sons got from me is not the same Italian that I got from my parents while I was growing up in Italy in, a, uh, in an Italian community. So what happens is that if children get enough input, then they regularize it, uh, uh, they, they regularize the inconsistency and variation, and the grammar itself may start changing. And we know that uh, 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 language contact is one of the reasons of, for diachronic change in languages that are successfully transmitted from generation to generation to generation. Um, if languages are not transmitted or they stop being transmitted, that language dies, and this is what happens to many minority, indigenous minority languages. But languages that continue to be alive change also because of attrition in uh, parental input in first generation uh, speakers. So the interesting point that I want to uh, get across is that there are convergences between what happens in first language attrition, in first generation attrition, and what happens in advanced second language acquisition. So there is a convergence um, for uh, between uh, first language changes due to attrition and second language learning. Uh, and this convergence is not random. It seems to be restricted to language structures that are interfacing with pragmatics and context. And this, we'd, we've done a lot of work on this. For example, the use of pronouns, just uh, to uh, show you a couple of examples from Italian. So, uh, uh, if you have uh, Italian, as you know, allows a choice between null pronouns and overt pronouns, but the choice is not random. Uh, it depends on the, uh, if you, depending on your model, but it depends basically on the topicality of the referent. Um, so in a sentence like that, Paola uh, greeted her mother when null she went out. That's potentially ambiguous. Uh, both uh, uh, potential antecedents could be the, uh, uh, the antecedent for the null pronoun, but the preferred interpretation uh, for uh, 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 native speakers of Italian is that the null pronoun prefers the uh, uh, antecedent in subject position. Uh, so the preferred, and I'm talking about preferences, I'm not talking about categorical choices, but the preferred interpretation is that the null pronoun refers to the subject antecedent, um, and the overt pronoun in the same sentence, cuando lei uscita, when she went out, uh, the preferred interpretation is that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the overt pronoun refers to the non-subject, However, uh, for bilinguals, for bilinguals, so the first interpretation for the overt, for the null pronoun, bilinguals and monolinguals are the same. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm using the term monolingual here, uh, despite everything that I said before. So uh, we can come back to this. Um, 
But for the overt pronoun, this is where we see a difference. Uh, so uh, for bilinguals, there is an ambiguity. So the preference is not that uh, strong and the overt pronoun can also refer to the uh, subject antecedent. So the most topical antecedent, if you want uh, to talk about degrees of topicality. Now, uh, so uh, so uh, it seems that uh, 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 there is a convergence. So in the sense that both uh, first uh, native speakers of Italian under attrition and advanced second language speakers of Italian do the same thing. So these two populations converge into this change for the overt pronoun, the interpretation of the overt pronoun. Now, we also know that the change is reversible, at least partly reversible, by re-immersion in the L1. So we did this study on Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, in many respects, in all, or not in all respects, but in many respects is like Italian. And we found that re-exposure of Spanish speakers under attrition to Spanish in their original community partly undid this effect in the sense that their preferences for the overt pronoun were kind of intermediate after the exposure between the uh, preferences of bilingual speakers who were still in the second language community and monolingual or native speakers of Spanish in Spain. Uh, so there was a partial reversal due to immersion in the native community. So what causes these changes? One interpretation is that, okay, uh, you know, there are effects, uh, linguistic effects in both, uh, in both directions when you learn a second language. So there are effects from the first language to the second language, but also from the second language to the first language. However, we also know uh, that these effects are found regardless of the linguistic distance between the L1 and the L2. So for example, there are studies of bilingual speakers of Italian and Spanish, or bilingual speakers of Spanish and Greek, or bilingual speakers of European Portuguese and Italian. So all null subject languages of the same type, of the same kind, where we also found, the, the, what was found what is the uh, 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 um, more variability in the interpretation of the overt pronoun that can refer both to topical antecedents and non-topical antecedents, much more than for uh, uh, native speakers, uh, non-bilingual speakers of these languages. So uh, we can't just stick to this, uh, you know, mutual linguistic influence explanation. So we are considering another explanation at the moment, which uh, takes into account the fact that a bilingual speaker obviously has a grammar that makes you know, a particular uh, pronominal forms, a pronominal system available, a, a choice of pronominal forms, but the use of those forms depends on interface conditions that denote an evaluation of context. So the pragmatics of context, um, and the contextual um, conditions that have to be evaluated all the time. They're not given for good because it depends on the situation. It depends on how the situation evolves. It depends on um, uh, uh, really adapting the choice of pronouns to changes in context. And that is not just a linguistic uh, property, is also a cognitive pro property. So we're looking also at um, at these kind of interface conditions. Let's not forget that when, so what we are looking for is, you know, this coordination between choice of pronominal forms and contextual conditions. Sometimes this coordination is uh, uh, easy, sometimes it's less easy for a variety of reasons. When the coordination is more difficult, it's not that bilingual speakers start using pronouns randomly. What they do, in fact, is they are over explicit. So they over 
they um, generalize the most explicit form. Remember the overt form, not the null. The null continues to be used in a proper way, but it's the overt pronoun that is overextended to context in which you would expect a null. So uh, bilinguals tend to be over explicit. They produce fewer reduced form and they generalize, if you want, the most explicit, the most redundant form. And that might be for various reasons that we don't fully understand. It might be because they might have a higher threshold for deciding when to drop a pronoun. Uh, because they, being bilingual, they're more aware of ambiguity and they're more aware of the other person's perspective. Remember, I mentioned this as one of the post potential cognitive effects that has been found. They have better perspective taking abilities. So if they're sensitive to ambiguity, they may want to reduce ambiguity. And so they overuse the most explicit form because you know when you use the most explicit form in context where you shouldn't really, you are redundant, but you're not ambiguous. If you drop a pronoun in context where you shouldn't, you run the risk of being ambiguous and therefore not fully understood. So uh, there is a tendency away from ambiguity and towards redundancy in bilinguals, which is very interesting and worth uh, researching more. So we are investigating these bilingual adaptations in cognitive terms as well as in linguistic terms. And we think that, uh, as I said, perspective taking might be one of the factors involved. Also, a trade off between ability to inhibit one language, the language not in use, and ability to integrate called contextual factors and pragmatic factors. And we know from cognitive psychology that there is a trade-off between those two uh, factors. So the better you are at inhibiting, the less good potentially you are at integrating. Remember, disengaging from inhibition is, is, is actually has to do with that. If you inhibit and then you have to pull together. So if you inhibit, you, uh, you go in one direction and you uh, exclude everything else. When you integrate, you have to do exactly the opposite. You have to pull things together. So there may be a trade-off in that respect. And for second language speakers in particular, who learned a, a second language when they already had learned their first language. And so they had to apply more inhibition to their first language while they were learning and using the second language that trade-off effect might be there, and it might be solved in the direction of overextending the most explicit form when integration is not successful. Uh, but also there may be, you know, a better communicative efficiency in bilingual speakers. So again, they don't use pronouns randomly. They go in the direction of being redundant rather than ambiguous. And again, you know, uh, that is another trade-off, if you want, between simplicity and informativeness, which is solved, you know, so the, the, the simpler you are, the less informative you are in principle, the more informative you are, the less simple, the more complex you are. And this tension is solved by bilinguals in a communicatively efficient way by uh, going in the direction of uh, overextending explicit forms rather than overextending null forms that, or using random uh, pronouns randomly. Um, so uh, this is exactly what I said, so I'll skip this. So again, we have an adaptive con cognitive control system that is shaped uh, in different ways by different types of bilingual experience. And the working hypothesis that we have at the moment on this ecosystem, I love this word, the ecosystem of uh, first language attrition and second language acquisition is that they are actually two sides of the same coin. So in fact, we think that successful second language acquisition actually involves some degree of attrition. So selective changes in the first language that lead to this selective convergence between L1 and L2 that I've illustrated with pronouns. So that means that proficient bilinguals are not like monolinguals in either language. So again, the very good reason to give up this comparison with, between bilinguals and monolinguals. When we talk about proficient bilingualism, we are not really talking about the sum of two monolinguals, nor should we expect 
proficient bilinguals to behave like monolinguals in either language, either in the second language or in the first language. Um, and the third point that I wanted to make is that even exposure to multilingual societies affects the first language. And again, this is yet another reason why monolingualism should really be uh, downplayed and ultimately abandoned. So we know that uh, more and more societies are multilingual. Even societies that, you know, uh, have majority languages, national languages, and so on. Migration is a reality that is growing. So more and more exposure to multilingual communities. So the question is, can we really look at, when we look at monolinguals, so to speak, living in multilingual societies, are they really monolingual? And there are two very interesting studies that I want to mention here. One is um, passive exposure in classrooms and communities. So we did a study on passive language exposure in multilingual classrooms. So we compared, this was a study on, on Scottish um, classrooms, we compared uh, more multilingual classrooms where there was a higher number of migrant children with less multilingual classrooms with a higher number of monolingual Scottish English children. And we gave them a new language to learn over a long period of time. This was a, a longitudinal study over a year. And they all learned Spanish. Spanish was new for everybody. There were no migrant children who knew Spanish. So it was a new language for everybody. And we also gave them tests of English and cognitive tests. Uh, and we measured the degree of multilingualism in the classroom. So what we found is that, first of all, a greater number of multilingual children were better at learning Spanish, not very surprisingly, uh, because they already had a language, even if they were still learning English as the language of the environment in some cases. But also we found a very interesting emerging trend, which are pursuing, we are pursuing with uh, new evidence at the moment, where the monolingual Scottish children in more multilingual classrooms actually performed better than in the monolinguals in less multilingual classrooms. So that means that even passive exposure to other languages that these children didn't even understand, but they were exposed to other languages actually had an effect on their performance, uh, both in terms of learning another language, but also cognitive tests. And this a study by my good friend and colleague, um, Judy Crow in California, was a study of passive exposure in multilingual societies on adults. And they compared, uh, Crow and Weiss compared monolinguals. All these people define themselves as monolingual Americans who said, I don't speak any other language, I only speak English. They were in California. A bunch of them were in California and others were in Pennsylvania. California is a more multilingual area and society than central Pennsylvania. I'm not talking about Philadelphia. I'm talking about central Pennsylvania. And everybody, and then there were bilingual groups as well. Everybody had to learn a new language. The new language was Finnish, which is a very difficult language at the best of times. And uh, so, and then after a while, after a few weeks, everybody got behavioral tests, but also their brains were measured with uh, electrophysiological methods. And what was really interesting here was that behaviorally, there were no, no difference between Californians and Pennsylvanians. Everybody had learned some Finnish and everybody did pretty much the same. But from the point of view of the brain, the brain of the Californians was much closer to the brain of the bilinguals than the brain of the Pennsylvanians. And that, you know, uh, is very interesting because it might mean, although the, the, they didn't have the longer term uh, data, that uh, even passive exposure to multilingual communities may prepare the brain to learn other languages better. And uh, again, you know, this uh, is being pursued at the moment and uh, we need more data, but very interesting preliminary data. So I'm really approaching the end of my uh, lecture. The takeaway messages are the following. First of all, 
uh, language learning, multilingualism in societies has effects on monolingualism and nativeness. So the concept of the native monolingual who never changes um, uh, is really uh, uh, something that we should put aside because it's uh, it's not there in what in what we find in research. So these are good reasons not to use either monolingual or native speakers as a point of reference to evaluate bilinguals as we've been using, we, me included, for a long time. Uh, it are very good reasons not to, to adopt bilingualism as a default for any study on language or language processing. I'm saying this because much research on language processing uh, still doesn't take into account whether people are multilingual or monolingual. They only look at, you know, native speakers of English. Well, how many languages do they know? If they know other languages, they may actually, uh, 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 their processing may be different from uh, those sp speakers who don't speak as many languages or speak those languages less, less well. And um, languages influence each other in all bilinguals. This is a normal, normal, predictable process that we still don't understand very well. We are understanding more and more, but it should be entirely predictable. And it's not, it doesn't mean loss. It means change, natural change. And the effects are visible to different extents depending on the type of bilingual experience, as uh, I hope I showed before. So we shouldn't expect bilinguals or multilinguals to behave like monolinguals. These are very important messages for society as well as for researchers. Um, and we should really compare bilinguals along a continuum, as I said before, defined by the many variables that need to be properly understood. So when we look at this controversy in research on bilingualism about whether there is a bilingual advantage or not, sometimes the solution that has been proposed is, oh, let's get bigger samples. Let's get big, very big samples rather than smaller samples. Well, that's not going to help unless we understand how these different factors play, what role these different factors play. And we still don't understand how the interactions uh, among these different factors play uh, uh, pan out. So until we understand that, uh, having a much bigger sample doesn't really address the question, I'm afraid. It's a, fa it's a false, false solution. So we should avoid dichotomies. We should avoid dichotomies. We should really look both ways, cognitive versus social, universals versus variation, biologies versus culture, innate versus learned. We all grew up with dichotomies, but I think for complex phenomena like bilingualism, we should really look both ways, which means more interdisciplinary research and more bridges among different subfields of research on languages, on language learning, on bilingualism, and certainly research and society. So I'll stop here now. I'll probably talk too much. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Antonella. Thank you. Shall so I we shall I have time for questions? So um, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, if you click on the reactions button and raise your hand, um, then you can ask a question or give a comment. I have raised my hand. Hello, Lydia. Hi. Hi, Angela. <laughs> nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> a great talk. But um, I, I have some, I'm not sure if it's going to be a question or a comment on the, the, the monolingual bilingual comparison. So, um, you know, what you pointed to is what Blythe Roman originally called the comparative fallacy. We should not be comparing l tours and native speakers. And I both agree and disagree with this. So I agree the numerical comparisons are not what we want to do. Are they statistically different from each other? But it is, I think, sometimes useful. And in fact, I think you've been doing this in all the studies you told us about today to know, you know what kind of things are there in a monolingual grammar that are or are not the same in a bilingual grammar? So the use of overt subjects, you can only, 
point to, or you have in all your work, pointed to the fact that bilinguals, in quotes, overuse overt subjects, uh, uh, overt pronouns, in comparison to monolinguals. If you weren't looking at monolinguals, you wouldn't, at what phenomenon would you be talking about? I mean, you might want to talk about the bilingual use of pronouns in any case, but it's the, the, the monolinguals that let, or the difference between the two, not the quantitative, but the qualitative difference that kind of, as, as far as I can see from reading all your stuff, led you down that path. So it's not clear to me that we can completely give up uh, these comparisons. And then th there's that such, a, I think that's a comment, but you can comment back. Because it seems to me, I'm not sure if this is true, but if you take what you just, what you said, you shouldn't even be comparing bilinguals to each other. I'm not sure about that, but you know, the, 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 the kind of logical extension is you can't compare anyone to anyone, perhaps. I don't know. Thank you very much for pointing out the contradictions that I think I've admitted you know, <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> I said, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm a sinner as well. Um, right. Uh, I mean, you know, even in, in our own, you know, my own studies, you know, on pronouns, yes, I mean, the comparison of bilinguals and monolinguals. But, you know, we didn't really look at the, biling the monolinguals, you know. Um, uh, I mean, the comparison was, yeah, more like a native versus non-native, actually, rather than monolingual versus yeah, okay. But, but, but even that, you know, we didn't really pay attention, you know, to the background of the native speakers, right? Uh, you know, how many languages did they know and so on? And maybe if we had looked at that, you know, we would have found, you know, a more complex pattern of results. So I think you ultimately what we need to give up, you know, uh, both conceptually and statistically <laughs> is this uh, comparisons, you know, um, that use, you know, so analysis of variance uh, on averaging across groups, okay? So you, you get, you know, a, a group of monolinguals or whatever, you know, a group of bilinguals and you, which you assume are homogenous, right? Because you have to, and you average them on that assumption, and then you compare the averages. And if the, if the comparison is significant, then, you know, you have a significant difference, otherwise not. I think that statistically and conceptually, we should give up that because what really matters a lot more these days are interactions <laughs> rather than uh, main effects, okay, statistically. So we should really give up the idea of main effects. Interactions are much more interesting. But in order to measure interactions with these many different aspects of bilingualism that we are still trying to fully understand, we should also give up, you know, obviously comparisons of the analysis of variance kind and use, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, mix effect models. And uh, I'm not giving a lecture on this because I'm not a statistician, but definitely, you know, uh, we are doing this more and more, giving up, you know, the idea of comparing two homogenous groups. So to go back to your question about pronouns, I think it would be very interesting yeah, can, you, can we compare bilinguals with bilinguals? Yes, I, if we give up this idea of comparing homogenous groups, then, you know, we can really compare people who are more bilingual or more balanced bilinguals, perhaps, uh, with people who are less balanced bilinguals, okay? People who have more of an experience of, you know, living in the second language community versus people who don't or have less experience. So we are really, you know, quantifying factors that um, are continuous rather than dichotomous. And that makes life more complicated, <laughs> for sure, but also a lot more interesting. It's Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question from Valentina, if you'd like to ask your question. Hi. Uh, you're on mute, Valentina. 
we can't hear. Sorry. So, <laughs> hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Antonella, for this great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question. I'm, I'm thinking about the repercussion on study on language impairments. Um, so, well, so when we test a person who has langu specific language impairment, also kids, for example. So if monolinguals are not considered as baseline, should we have like how we, how we should proceed in this case? Should we have more than one baseline for each language? I, I mean, what you, do you think about this? Well, uh, again, you know, it, uh, I don't have a ready answer to give you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've done, I'm doing some work on, on, on impairments, you know, it's not my specialty, but I'm working on autism, for example, in, in bilingualism. And again, there, you know, as you know, better than me, autism is a continuum, you know, it's not that you're either autistic or not. And so, you know, there, you know, we have a natural, a natural continuum. Now, uh, yes, I mean, again, you know, our life would be a lot simpler if we can simply have, you know, a monolingual control group that we assume to be homogenous. Once you start accepting that, you know, this homogeneity is not there, then, uh, then the comparisons become more complex, again, more, both conceptually and statistically. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, we have to face this. You know, because uh, yeah, um. yeah. I I would I would say that especially in those um, places where bilingualism is really um, at place, like in many regions in Italy. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, some regions in Italy. Yeah, some. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm Sicilian, so for me, it's like. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for... Uh... Yeah, no, but, but that's a very, you know, let, let's keep in touch because I'd like to pursue this. Uh... I, I mean, I'm working also on sign language and... I know you do. <laughs> yeah, this is a very, very big issue also um, for testing specific language impairment in deaf children when they... I know, are not, yeah. you know, and I, I'm aware that, you know, once if you give up, you know, this monolingual point of reference, you know, you get many more, you get many more questions sure. that um, make, uh, again, life more interesting, but more complex. Let, let's, um, let's return on this. Uh, let's keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Michael, you have your hand raised. You want to go next? Right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Antonella. Great talk as always. And I've got a lot of, lot of questions, but uh, let me just ask two for the moment not to uh, monopolize. My first question will uh, sort of piggyback of uh, Lydia White's, uh, as usual, very poignant comment. So it will refer to your <laughs> point that um, L1 attritors or people who become L2 dominant uh, get reduced exposure to language variation. And let me just uh, give a brief anecdote here. So it's uh, one point I was a uh, consultant for a television program for children that um, was adopted from Malaysia and what was being adapted for the Polish market. So it was being translated and I would get the translations from two translators. And I would immediately know which one the translation came from because one of them had been um, living in Brazil for 10 years and this would show in her Polish. Mm -hmm. So now if you do want to have a point of reference uh, to compare uh, the L1 of uh, L2 dominant or LN dominant uh, speakers, would you then say that a good point of reference would be perhaps not so much um, contemporary uh, L1 speakers in the target country, but, may, but would that be perhaps either a, an uh, immigrant diaspora that the person is part of, uh, where they tend to uh, where the diaspora tends to still use the L1 as the dominant language, so not a heritage language? Or would you say that uh, you'd have to go back, for instance, to recordings or, and uh, to norms from uh, the time when the person left the country, uh, in, just in case the language had changed and some of the rules had changed? And my second question 
um, concerns the uh, remark that uh, bilinguals tend to be over explicit, for instance, with overt pronouns. How does that relate to second language acquisition, especially early stages of second language acquisition? If, for instance, you have learners who start off with a pro-drop language as the L1 and are learning a language that is non-pro-drop. And, um, well, at least in the initial stages, they will often omit um, the pronoun because that's what they do in the L1. Uh, so um, what happens that they not only learn the parameter setting or, the res or they reset the parameter for the L2, but that they actually overdo it, uh, later overdo it? Very, very interesting questions. And I may, okay, I'll start from the last one and then I may ask you to remind me of the first one if I, if I don't remember the, uh, the, the, all the details. Um, for the question of pronouns, um, interestingly, and attrition you know, in pronominal use, uh, we, uh, we started from the assumption that uh, attrition doesn't really needs time to show up. Okay, unlike lexical attrition, which I said, you know, shows up quite early, uh, for some reason, you know, the, the assumption is that for grammar, you know, changes in the syntax, you need more exposure. The fact remains that we don't really know very much. Yes, I mean, you were saying, yeah, we know a little bit what happens, you know, in the early stages of, of uh, second language acquisition, but we don't really know, you know, we don't have many studies about how um, the effects on the first language progress, you know, over time from the beginning, you know, from the early stages of immersion in a second language community or the early stages of second language learning. Um, partly because, you know, I think we, we just implicitly assumed that uh, attrition takes time <laughs> to show up, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't really, I think, you know, even that needs to be revisited. And I think, you know, we should really focus more, perhaps with more methodologies. I mean, we, we may not find any effects whatsoever if we, if we test early, you know, stages of second language learners, if, you, if we test the RL1, you know, with, uh, I don't know, explicit behavioral methods, we may not find any, no difference whatsoever, but if we, find, if we test them with, uh, you know, non-behavioral methodologies, you know, and so on, we may actually find, you know, something maybe closer to what uh, the uh, Californian versus Pennsylvania study actually found. No differences on you know, the behavioral level, but, you know, the brain showed something you know already so there's a lot there's a lot that um that we we don't know and uh, many studies on attrition in syntax uh only look at people who have been exposed to a second language for a long time uh in um, for a number of years uh, typically in the second language community uh, rather than in the first language community and so on i don't know if i if i addressed your question or not in part, yes, yes. In part, yeah. Please, uh, you know, remind me of uh, what uh, other things, you know, I, uh, I didn't answer. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering about this um, um, symmetry, right? Uh, because uh, uh, whether you wouldn't expect a, a symmetry in L1 attrition uh, to the... Um, effect that uh, you might actually also find a higher rate of uh, pronoun dropping, right? In the early stages, yes, thank you. That's, that's the detail that I, you may find this in the early stages, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, um, but um, maybe not. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting hypothesis, right? On the basis of what I said, you may make the hypothesis that, you know, overuse of the overt pronoun in native speakers of null subject languages, uh, sorry, overuse of the null pronoun in native speakers of the null subject language is not found, and transfer of null subjects into the non-null subject language is also not found. Uh, the hypothesis is ready to be tested, right? And, you know, where that's... Uh, that's a, a useful prediction, which may be, uh, according to what I was saying, you know, we may not find, find that, um, you know, those effects. If the effects actually, well, 
again, you know, if the effects go in the direction of over explicitness, you know, sensitivity to the other and so on, then you wouldn't expect to find, you know, that the null pronoun is, uh, uh, you know, uh, transferred to the other language linguistically or or cognitively you know so the you know the the the, the cognitive explanation you know the over explicitness was partly a cognitive explanation right you know you're you're more sensitive to ambiguity you want to avoid ambiguity and by overusing over pronouns you do avoid ambiguity generally so in some cases you don't either but in most cases you do so what was your first question? <laughs> yeah, so, so if we do want a norm uh, for uh, to gauge uh, the changes in the L1 of people who are no longer L1 dominant, what would what should the reference point for that be, given that they uh, may have lost contact with uh, the uh, with a community uh, where some norms may have changed, and they will basically be unaware of that. Uh, and of course, the difference will be there, but it's not not that their language uh, had changed; is that the language of the norm or the normative community had changed? Well, well, that that depends on whether you know uh, whether the uh, the the language really develops another variety, and this happens, you know, for many languages. I mean, languages that have a lot of speakers. I mean, look at English. I mean, look at the varieties of English that have developed, you know, and that. You know, they are, I mean, as we know, varieties are languages. I mean, you know, dialects are languages. We're not getting into that, you know, political discussion about terminology. Um, but on the other hand, you know, yeah. So if if a language has developed, you know, a different variety, then yeah, I mean, it might make sense, you know, to measure attrition or whatever effects, you know, with comparison with that variety. If not, Yes, I mean, the question arises, you know, which speakers are you using as a point of reference? And that's where my, my observations, you know, at the beginning are also relevant, right? Because, you know, yeah, you may use native speakers who live in the, their original community as a point of reference, right? Um, we should also uh, measure how many languages they know, you know, even if they continue to live in their original community, they may not, you know, because of their experience, they may actually vary, you know, and, and they may not be this homogenous point of reference that, you know, we can take as, a, uh, you know, for our comparisons. So, so that's uh, that's what I that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean you you can generalize and say, yeah, the majority of people in this community, you know, behave in this way, regardless of their experience. But we should take that their experience in, into consideration uh, more and more so. Are they growing up in a multi? You know, are they surrounded by multilingual speakers? Do they live in a high migrant? You know, in a in a migrant in an in an area where many migrant uh, speakers also live? Um, have they learned you know foreign languages well at school? Probably not in many <laughs> in many countries. But you know, all these are factors that may affect the monolingual native status of people who continue to live in their native countries. Great. Molte grazie. There you go. <laughs> okay. Irene, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. Hi, Antonella. Um, <laughs> um, really, really interesting. Um, I actually also have a lot of questions. I'll try to limit myself to two. But before I begin, I actually, in your discussion of attrition in relation to the previous question, I, I wanted to mention something. I, You were not mentioning phonology. Of course, I'm going to talk about phonology, but a, a really interesting study that I read, I don't remember it, I can look it up and send you a reference, but actually it turns out that um, apparently attrition in phonology, or at least phonetics happens really quickly, surprisingly quickly. We don't even hear that somebody's changing their accent in their native language, but apparently if you do phonetic measurements, it gets picked up. I mean, th these things change really quickly. So that's an interesting thing in terms of, you know, how quickly do people get affected? So I thought that that's interesting. I'll look it up and send it to you. Um, but I had um, two 
questions, both a little bit self-serving. One is, you know, as a linguist, you know, I am, I believe that part of my, what I do, my job is to kind of describe a language. So if I want to describe the phonology or something of some language, I want to know what it is that I'm describing. And if I don't rely on some kind of native speaker or, you know, monolingual is hard to find, but some concept of that, I don't know what I'm describing anymore. Um, so, you know, from a practical perspective, what is it that I should be doing? Um, and the other question, it's also practical, but not in terms of what my own research, but just in terms of addressing other people is, uh, how do you make generalizations about bilinguals? Because it seems that so many of them have such different kinds of backgrounds that they bring and some have more exposure, less exposure, um, you know, different attitudes like you talked about. So how do we even, if I wanted to generalize about uh, bilingual populations, how do I even do that because of the variability? So those are the two things. Yes, uh, very interesting questions again. Um, how do we generalize? We, uh, we, uh, <laughs> I, I actually reviewed a paper that was very interesting on precisely on this um, very recently. And, um, uh, you know, this, this paper talked about, uh, you know, the science of bilingualism as a process of discovery. You know, so we should really, you know, first of all, you know, again, not look for big samples without understanding, you know, the characteristics of, you know, the many people that compose the sample, but, you know, uh, even smaller samples are fine if we obviously, you know, try to understand the interactions rather than, again, the comparisons, you know, between homogenous groups that are difficult to conceptualize even. Uh, but understanding, you know, the interactions that uh, uh, are present, you know, in this study and then in this study and this study. And slowly but steadily, you know, we pull together, you know, evidence that, uh, then, you know, we can really put together in a general picture. So, you know, it may be slow, it may be, you know, full of contradictions, what look like contradictions, you know, but, you know, if we again get together, you know, without fighting with one another, but actually collaborating with one another, um, we can actually uh, proceed in this, you know, sort of uh, process of scientific science discovery and uh, pulling together these multiple multiple factors and there is a lot that we still don't understand you know about the multiple factors some of them we understand better others we don't but particularly the interactions we don't understand very well okay but, but in the beginning i mean your whole talk is like we say bilinguals have this advantage or bilinguals ha don't have an advantage or you know and you're always talking and i understand i mean this is where i just conceptually just have such a hard time because it's so it is complicated um, you want to sort of say that, yeah. but then what, 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 where will we end up? Like bilinguals who have learned the, you know, become exposed at a certain age are going to have this. Do you have to, how much are we going to have to like kind of break it down to make any kind of. Well, you know, in principle, we have to break it down, but you know, the more we go into depth about these the factors, the more also we are, the better able we are to, you know, to generalize beyond the individual studies. So uh, we shouldn't be afraid of, you know, inconsistencies and particularly, you know, because it's so complex. So that's why, you know, these reactions are, oh, we don't find these effects, therefore the effects don't exist. Come on. I mean, you know, I really, I really feel that that is the wrong attitude to have scientifically and conceptually and everything, um, because there is so much that we don't understand. And, uh, and finding homogenous samples, as much as we try, we can try, right? You know, but <laughs> the reality is, uh, is definitely more complex. Yes. And what was your first question again? <laughs> this one was, how do you, like, what do you do about if you have any view of linguistics where you want to describe the grammar or the phonology of some language? Yeah. Actually, even the language teaching, you know, where you're teaching something, which is not, you know, I mean, somehow, just to take a personal example. So if, if somebody were asking somebody to teach English pronunciation in a class, of English class, they would ask me rather than you probably, although they, I mean, they could ask you, but for the pronunciation, you know, they might think that it would be more, you know, suitable to have somebody like me. So what do we do like for, 
you know, how do we address this question of like, you know, English or, you know, Uzbek or, you know, something like that, where you're trying to talk about the grammar or the phonology of some language. Wow. Yeah, that is actually, you know, we are doing more and more collaborations. Well, we work on minority languages, but, you know, now we're getting into collaborations with people who really work on endangered languages. <laughs> and endangered languages, you know, where, I mean, really endangered languages, where the process of inter intergenerational transmission is coming to an end, you know, and uh, we know that some of these, many of these languages will die, you know, within this century, uh, you know, many, many, many. So what, I, what do you describe? I mean, most of these languages survive in a situation of bilingualism with at least one majority language. I mean, yes, if you go in the middle of nowhere, you know, there are some endangered languages that are not in that situation, but many are, you know, and they may be endangered, you know, to different degrees, but they are in a situation of bilingualism. They survive in a situation of bilingualism. So I think that our... Our role, I mean, I'm not, I don't do this, you know, but, you know, uh, is also pointing out how, you know, these languages change over time also because of the natural influence, reciprocal influence of the majority language. Um, so, and I can tell you that, you know, from the point of view of, again, of public engagement, persuading, for example, you know, purists, speakers of Gaelic here in Scotland, that, oh, you know, they say Gaelic is going down the drain, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, people don't speak like, you know, my grandfather used to speak. Of course not. Uh, not only because the language is declining and there's nothing, you know, ultimately there's nothing we can do about that. But the more we understand, you know, how uh, languages in contact affect each other and how, you know, these changes tr are transmitted, you know, over generations, the less, the more realistic we are in language policies, for example. And we don't expect young people to speak like the grandparents, which puts them off. <laughs> to start with, you know, even if they had some motivation to speak Gaelic, you know, if we are prescriptive and we say, oh, you know, you, your Gaelic is rubbish. I mean, they don't want to speak it. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not really addressing your point, but just to say that, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, I can see, I can see your, your point, you know, I mean, native speakers of these languages, you know, where are they? Are they, you know, they are native speakers? Are they really monolingual speakers? Mm. <laughs> In yeah. most cases, no. Uh, and no so- problem. But this echoes actually the previous question as well, because I can actually only really understand how the bilingual situation of the younger speakers is distinct or special in, if I'm able to compare it to the way their grandparents spoke, because I, otherwise I won't know, you know, what's changed yes. or what's not changed. So yeah, to some extent, we still need to rely on something that, yes. you know, could be very elusive. Um, it could be very elusive. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, you, we, we rely on some kind of point of reference, some kind of norm, yeah. in inverted commas, that, yeah. should, you know, and so, yes. So what's changed? We have to, if you talk about change, you have to, have some idea of what it started as to see what the change is. And that, that's also very kind that's of- Very challenging. And challenging, it's very <laughs> intriguing. And bilingualism, you know, plays a role, you know, for many of these languages. That's what, you know, we want to contribute, you know, in many cases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to see you. Okay, Angelique, do you have a question or comment next? Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to go back to the um, uh, explicit, explicitity of pronouns and uh, what you mentioned for bilinguals. And uh, so your idea is that they want to avoid ambiguity because they are more, let's say, aware of this or they are aware of ambiguity and they want to avoid it. And this is very interesting. However, there are data on bimodal bilinguals. So you mentioned them. Um, there are bilinguals who master spoken and sign language. And it appears that they do have present more uh, an influence from the non -pro the non product language to the the uh, sorry an influence from the product language to the non product language. So, for example, 
ASL English Bilinguals uh, on a study led by uh, Elena Kuli Dobrova. They, uh, they omit more subjects in English compared to monolinguals. Once again, they compare it to monolinguals. And on a case study we led also, we found a similar pattern for uh, French and French sign language. So my question would be, how to explain that there would like less of, I mean, why would bimodals and unimodals behave differently with your explanation of avoiding ambiguity? Because there's no reason to, there's no reason to claim that bimodals are for some reason less aware of ambiguity compared to unimodals. Yeah. So this is just an, yeah, piece of data I want you to have your, your opinion you. on. <laughs> And I wish I had a very clear answer. I don't, uh, but I can. I can tell you something though. Um, it, yeah, the role of um, sensitivity to ambiguity, you know, with respect to bimodals. I don't know. I mean, that's a very interesting point. I don't have an answer right now, but I can see another link with um, you know what I said about uh, the need to inhibit you know so inhibition and uh, integration right and the potential trade off there. Now, um, if you're a bimodal bilingual, in principle, and I know I've had long discussions with Helena uh, Kulidobrova, you know, she was visiting Edinburgh last year, you know, and we are in touch, you know, she's, she's wonderful. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, very nice discussions. Um, so, so a bimodal bilingual in principle doesn't need to inhibit, you know, one of the languages, as I said, because there's no competition between, between the channels, you know, so uh, obviously, um, you know, you can sign and, and bimodals often do sign and speak at the same time, even when they're talking to a unimodal, you know, somebody who doesn't know any sign language, um, uh, this has been noticed. Uh, so um, interestingly, uh, unimodal signers, and there are studies on this, so people who use two sign languages overextend the overt pronoun. So, so these, are, these are deaf people who use two sign languages. So in that case, yes, you, you have to inhibit one of the languages because you can't sign both of them at the same time. So it's the same kind of conflict that you have for the typical unimodal bilingual with two spoken languages. And in that case, it, in the limited evidence that we have, you see an overextension of the overt form. So uh, this doesn't answer your question directly because you were asking about avoidance of ambiguity. And that is uh, a question that you know needs an answer. But from the point of view of cognitive control and uh, you know this um, um, potential trade-off between inhibition and integration, um, yeah, we see a picture that seems to be consistent with the yeah. idea. Thank you for this answer. That, yeah, it was a bit my point. So the idea was that, of course, and I understand the idea of avoiding ambiguity, but maybe it's just, we may, to, we may need to add more in the, uh, to this. Because of course, by mod I mean, having two modalities to be expressed, I mean, having two uh, languages belonging to different modalities also influences this. So uh, avoiding ambiguity is Yes, to be very. I mean, is a very good point, but um, but yes, we have to. Yeah. Absolutely. If you have any interesting references about that, please send it to me. Okay. That's thank a you. Very interesting point that you know uh, needs to be explored. Thank you. Thanks to you. Okay, so there are no more hands raised, so I'll just pass over to Antonis if you would like to make some final points. Yes, Annie, thank you. Well, Antonella, <laughs> what a presentation. <laughs> I have a lot of things. I would prefer we were in a conference to continue our discussion in the cafe and then lunch under the trees now, right? Good. Oh, no, no. With the trees, we southerners, we go under the trees. Northerners, they go in the open air to have the sun, right? Okay. So, 
Uh, I have a few things. Um, I wouldn't disagree in anything, as a matter of fact, but what you said, bilingualism, and I totally agree, is a continuous dimension and not a categorical. So, and it's the first time I hear it from you. Although I don't read so many articles on this topic, uh, this is the one comment. Uh, the other was about uh, the interactions in language. In most aspects of language studies, interactions are more important than the main effects. A combination of those two is, uh, is the best approach, but usually interactions show us more, much more than the main effects do. And now I'm coming to the question. It's about intuition. I'm a nearly native speaker of Swedish. Oh, wow. Good. But as soon as I talk, they understand that I'm a foreigner. Number one. Number two, I'm not sure about prepositions. And number three, about feminine, feminine, masculine nouns. It's not that clear cut in Swedish, but anyhow. Well, and this is something people, native speakers have the intuitions. I guess we were talking the other day, but it's parallel with phonetics. Once you miss the critical age, you talk all your life like a foreigner. People can understand. I mean to say, I have a colleague in the States. He went there 18 years old. He is now 70. And I asked the, his students, can you notice that he's not a native speaker? speaker, and they said, certainly, yes. He has grown up family, et cetera, et cetera. Well, my thing is that it is not so much, it is a cognitive thing, but it has to do with the brain wiring in a way. So it, it, it must have some brain physical correlates as well. I mean, to say, when we grow up, we have our network, brain network system, right? And once we have passed some AIDS, then we have, then, then the new language does not fit in this system. So you have to develop something parallel. So what do you have to say about this aspect? I mean, this is a question from an in, in your arm, right? Um, well, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm not a brain person either, right? But I, I, I have enough people, you know, who work on the brain around me. What I can say to that, and maybe this is, a, you know, again, I, to conclude with a, something provocative, right? The brain is a lot more flexible than we thought. The brain remains more flexible, much more flexible than we thought when you and I were students. I mean, really, uh, this is what much research on the brain is showing, that brain plasticity remains with you for much longer than we thought even in you know, the fairly recent past. That is what Mina Lettonen in our last um, tutorial said, exactly this. Right. And so, you know, yes. So it's clear, clearly, you know, learning something as a child, not just language, you know, but learning, other, you know, has some very important effects on the brain. That doesn't mean that you can't learn, a, you know, you don't learn in the same way that, okay, but it doesn't mean that you can't learn later in life. And that applies to language, it applies to other skills as well, okay?
But also what I was saying about attrition in this bad term again, you know, to use it, um, what, you know, the effects, you know, the important effects of learning as a child um, are not there forever. And, you know, new experiences can actually modify the state of your brain. And this is what we need to understand better. And I think, you know, that is potentially very good news because it means that, you know, it's not that if you didn't learn something as a child, well, you know, it's too late. <laughs> um, clearly, you know, we are working on people who learn another language, learn another language much later in life. We want to see what happens if you start a language in your 70s, right? A completely new language. Now, you know, if you're 70 compared to when you're 20, you don't have a lifetime in front of you, unfortunately, to improve that language, right? But what happens in your brain, you know, can actually surprise you. You know, the brain is very responsive even at that age. So, you know, uh, again, short-term effects and, you know, learning something without aspiring to, you know, absolute perfection, um, it is possible even later on. So all this to say from somebody who, you know, is not, you know, a neurologist, I'm not, you know, working on the brain is not my main speciality, but I think we need to take this into account. Uh, but still... Um... I would like to know a little bit more than a guesswork what is intuition, language intuition, and how we can study it. I mean to say I can study it, it's simply the, the, the surface. I mean to say put some prepositions, put some nouns with feminine and, and, and check what the intonation of a, of a group is, more foreigners or less foreigners or whatever. But I, I don't know what intuition is and how we should define it. It is something vague, something, uh, an abstract idea or something we can touch. Very interesting question, and I wish I had the answer, you know, for you. Um, but again, you know, I, as somebody, I can tell you, you know, my experience, you know, in the past, I've done a lot of work on acceptability judgments, as you know, right? And, uh, you know, I experimented with magnitude estimation of linguistic acceptability for the first time, importing these methods from psychophysics into the study of um, a grammaticality judgments in linguistics. Now, um, a grammaticality judgment is a piece of behavior. It's not the same. So in a way, there's no way we can behaviorally ac ac uh, access intuitions in the sense that I think you mean, okay? We can only measure them behaviorally, more or less well, you know, and magnitude estimation allows you to measure gradients in a better way than other methods, right? But it's still, you know, you don't have immediate access to intuitions. Now, if you have access to the brain, you may have access to brain reactions, you know, that are not behavioral, right? Right. They, you know, they may be the precursor, the basis of behavior or whatever, but they are not behavior. So that's a useful addition that we can give. But from a behavioral point of view, intuitions, what you call intuitions are not directly testable. We can do better and worse with judgments, but a judgment is something else from an intuition. Precisely. A judgment, you know, involves other factors on top of an intuition. Thank you. And another small thing I would talk with you. Uh, what about your groups? Uh, have you thought about uh, the Greek dialect in, uh, in Calabria and Sicily? The gringo? No, no. Uh, it's something to study. And, and in, in, in the Otrando area, there are 10 villages who speak, who still speak um, the dialects. 
I know, I know. Well, it would be very interesting. If we you are interested, I have contacts. I mean, here in Athens at the university, I have a colleague, a professor. She is a Greek speaker herself, and she has done a lot of work down there in, 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 uh, in deep southern Calabria. Very interesting to know. I wish I had several lives, you know. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, <laughs> we all do want to, you know, to have several lives. But, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, I'm working on bilingualism, I'm working on, you know, I wish I could be, do more work on the syntax pragmatics interface, the syntax lexicon interface. I'm doing a lot of public engagement work for which I feel immensely motivated politically, you know, because bilingualism can be very political in in the original sense, in the etymological sense. And I'm really engaged in that. But, you know, hey, there's a limit to what we can do. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Antonella. It was a great pleasure and honor to have you here with us today. And it's only the start. Okay. We will certainly continue. Um, thank you all of you, thank you, Annie. And thank you all of you, a great applaud for Antonella. Can I just say, if people want my slides, I can make them available. I can send them to you and then you can make available. Yes, okay. please send them to me and I will, uh, I will send them to all uh, um, excellent society. And, and, and your video will be uploaded onto YouTube. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.